Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome here to our worship service today. Welcome, everybody, from Occidental Presbyterian Church and Eagle Rock Presbyterian Church gathered here in the internet to worship God. Let's all join together now in our call to worship. Called to be branches in Christ's body. We yearn to be connected to the vine. Called to be mustard bushes offering shade to God's creatures. We search for places to plant the seeds of faith. Called to be growing with God in the midst of this world's painful questions. We seek God's nurturing presence. Let's come together and worship. Brothers and sisters in Christ, part of acting faithfully in our relationship with God is to go to God and to confess our sins, to let go of our sins, to let go of the power uh, that those sins have in our lives. And to do that, we pray together our prayer of confession. So let's join together in prayer. Lord God, we confess that we do not always understand your ways. We get discouraged when life takes unexpected turns and our carefully laid plans and dreams come to nothing. We confess that we are quick to give up when things get difficult and quick to question your presence and your power. Forgive us. Grant us patience to wait for your good timing. Open our eyes to recognize your leading in our lives, to listen for your gentle whisper when we least expect it. And then give us courage to step out in faith and obedience, trusting in your leading even when we cannot yet see the outcome. Let's continue in a moment of silent confession. Friends, hear this good news today. 
Christ came into the world to bring us forgiveness. Christ takes our sins away, takes away the power of sin in our lives, and opens us up to new lives, to live in new ways for God. So know now that we are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Come 
Please join with me in our prayer for illumination. Loving God, fountain of every blessing, open us to your life-giving word and fill us with your Holy Spirit so that living water may flow through our hearts, a spring of hope for a thirsty world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Our scripture for today comes from Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 through 56. Let's listen for the word of God. Jesus came to his hometown and began to teach the people in their synagogue. So that they were astounded and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own country and in their own house. And he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in the 19th century, there was a philosopher, a guy named Thomas Carlyle, and he espoused what's become known as the great man theory. He said a couple of things. He said, the history of the world is but the biography of great men. And he also said, all things that we see standing accomplished in the world are properly the outer material result, the practical realization and embodiment of thoughts that dwelt in the great men. These thoughts sent into the world, the soul of the whole world's history may be justly considered were the history of these great men. My response to this, for the record, no, no. That's not right, Carlisle. I think you're wrong here. I mean, yeah, the history of the world certainly has been shaped by the leadership of great men and great women. But that, in no way, is the whole story. The world and history, rather, is shaped by every one of us being who we are in the places God has led us. We're finishing up today our series on the saints of L.A. And I've introduced it with this hope that from these stories we can see what's possible, see where God can take us in the future. And these people that I've presented are, for the most part, people with incredible influence and impact on church history and culture. No doubt about that. But the truth is, that is not the path that God has designed for all of us. And it's definitely not the only definition of faithful living. I mean, the Bible itself tells us the stories of faithful kings and faithful shepherds, faithful generals and faithful servants. And what God praises in all these stories is not power and influence, but rather faithfulness. These people working for God's kingdom and showing us what's possible through faithfulness. Now, in our tradition as Protestants and as Presbyterians, we define saint not just as someone who has dramatically altered the course of history or has led some unbelievable and amazing life, but rather a saint is anyone who acts faithfully, who acts for Christ in the situations and context where they are. So all of the faithful are saints, whether you get a building named after you or not. Because no one great person can build the kingdom of God. It's the calling of all of us. And so today, to conclude our look at the saints of L.A., 
we're going to look at the life of Art Doyle. Here's a picture of him right there. That is a funny picture. I love that picture. Art Doyle, if you've never heard that name before. He was a member of Occidental Presbyterian Church and a beloved member of the wider Eagle Rock community. Art was born in 1962 in the L.A. neighborhood known by many as Frogtown. Art had a rough upbringing. Before he was even a teenager, he had become addicted to drugs. That had a tremendous impact on his life. And it wasn't until much later in life that he got clean by his own accounts by simply going cold turkey. As a young adult, he worked odd jobs here and there, and through a long series of misfortunes, poor choices, and just plain bad circumstances, Art became homeless as a middle-aged man. In the early 2010s, he took up residence on the stoop of Occidental Presbyterian Church, sleeping there every night next to the doorway. Now the session, the leadership of the church, they got together to decide what to do. They thought we could call the police and have them kicked out of here, or we could invite them to church. Let's try inviting them to church. So that's what they chose. And they went to Art, and they invited him to church, and he accepted. Not only did he start coming to church, but he became, became active in the church come on every Sunday morning, and he would go to summer camp. He served as a liturgist in the worship service. And his big responsibility at church was the big sign out on the street. He would come up with clever things to put on the sign, and they would go out there and put the letters together. Often there were spelling errors, and he would get grief from other people in the neighborhood for his spelling errors, but that was his pride and joy right there. He accepted the life of discipleship to Christ, and he took it seriously. And he was known by everyone in the area because he was warm, he was funny, he was kind, and he cared. He cared about other people. And also he'd give. He'd give from the very little that he had for other people. He was known by many as the mayor of Eagle Rock. And all the while, despite the church's best efforts, he remained homeless. He remained there on the stoop. We'd offer help and he'd push back. He'd make excuses, forget to fill out paperwork, and it drove people crazy that we couldn't get art out of homelessness. There was one Sunday that I remember where the two of us had lunch after service and he looked uncharacteristically down. He looked really depressed. And I asked him, I said, what was up? And he said some other people on the streets had asked him to do a task for them. And this task included a violent act, hurting someone else. I didn't get any more specifics from him than that. But he said that he had told these people no. He wouldn't do it because that's not who he is and that's not what he does. And then those people who had asked him to do this violent act, they told him, what does it matter? All you are is a bum, a homeless nobody. And he was so hurt. He was so hurt by this because he knew these people were wrong about him. But part of him felt that they were right. And he was so upset because he knew that he was a beloved child of God, but that so many people refused to see anything other than a bum. Well, he didn't do that violent act. And he worked hard to avoid those people. And after seven years or so of living on the stoop, the church was finally able to help Art get into Section 8 housing. And he moved. He moved far away, actually, and we didn't really see him much anymore. We'd hear from him occasionally. 
while he sounded like he was doing okay, he also sounded like he was pretty lonely. Then in 2019, he had a fall at home and he hit his head really badly. He went to the hospital and then to long-term care. And then his body, after just years and years and years of rough living, his body finally gave out. We held Art's memorial service at Occidental Presbyterian, and it was standing room only. We had to bring in tons of extra chairs. People were huddled up in the hallway. All these people from the community, people we knew, people we didn't know, they all wanted to come and celebrate his life because he was a kind man, a troubled man, but one who cared and one who radiated the love of Christ. He was a saint here in L.A. Now in our passage from Matthew, Jesus, he's preaching in his hometown, the place where he grew up. And people don't, they don't know what to make of it. He teaches with power and authority. And they respond, where did this, where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is, it, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? We, we, we know that family. And are not all his sisters with us? Where then... Did this man get all this? And it says in verse 57, and they took offense at him. These people, they, they see Jesus and they see how well he teaches and how he's able to do great things. And their response is, but isn't this just the carpenter's son? Or in a way they're saying, the definition that we have for a great teacher and leader he doesn't fit this. Jesus, that's not you. You don't fit what we know as a great person. You're, you're just the carpenter's son. Now, here's the really interesting part. Verse 58, it says, And Jesus did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. Wow. Wow. Okay, but how, how, how do we read that? How do we read verse 58 there? A couple of ways to read it. Well, it's, we could read it as punitive in the sense that Jesus is saying, oh, you don't believe? Well then, psh, I'm not going to do any acts of power here. But I would say that doesn't mesh with the character of who Jesus is, who willingly gives of himself even to the undeserving. We might read it as something like, well, Jesus was, was handicapped by their disbelief. That somehow Jesus was, uh, his power was taken away because of people's disbelief. But we know, though, that even in Gethsemane, when Jesus is arrested, when all these people are there to take him to trial, he says he has the power to call down angels, legions of angels to fight on his behalf. He has that power. So I don't think that Jesus is handicapped because of people's disbelief. Now, I would say the scripture here is putting the onus on the people and their unbelief. In other words, it's to say that when we put people into limiting categories, when we put people into boxes like they do with Jesus, we not only diminish that person, but we diminish ourselves as well. It's this very act of saying, no, you don't fit how we think you should, or you aren't what we think you should be. That limits the people's ability to experience Jesus' deeds of power. But simply, when we diminish people by giving them labels, putting them in boxes, putting them in inferior categories. We are diminishing the power of God in our own lives. This is a picture of Art Doyle. And in it, he's 
standing with his fellow church members. And he looks happy. I would say even he even looks proud, a feeling that I would bet is not often felt by people dealing with homelessness. I would say here that he knows and has assurance that he is a child of God. And so are we all. And that is the only label that counts, that we are children of God, beloved of Jesus Christ. So children of God, saints here in LA, let's live faithfully, showing the love of Christ in all the places that God takes us, refusing to diminish people, refusing to put people in boxes because we know that God sees us as so much more. Amen. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my This is my daily bread.
Children of God, those who are loved by God, I want to invite you now into a time of prayer. I know we were all dealing with a lot of stress, a lot of changes, a lot of uncertainty, and it wears on us. It drags us down. It is hard to feel motivated or inspired right now. But we can take this time to go to God to lift our hearts up to God, to seek out God's power. So let's join together. I want you to join with me in prayer. Let's pray. God, you have called us to be a people of prayer, to continue the ministry of intercession handed on to us by Jesus Christ himself. And so we come before you with confidence, bringing our prayers For this world and these people whom you love, in your mercy, hear and answer. We pray for those who, like Jesus' disciples, find themselves surrounded by high winds and stormy seas, those who feel overwhelmed by events and circumstances, the loss of a job, the death of a loved one, serious illness, chronic pain, depression, or divorce, and they don't know where to turn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are experiencing a crisis of faith, who long to wholeheartedly trust in God, but are held back by questions and doubts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have fallen into despair, who have begun to doubt God's presence and power, or question God's call in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have had their hopes and dreams crushed, those whose lives have suddenly taken a different turn, and who now wonder what lies ahead for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, it is not your will that any should suffer. We offer our prayers for all those who hunger and thirst, for those who live in the midst of violence or poverty, and those who feel abandoned or ignored by the world around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through the life-giving power of your Holy Spirit, make your sustaining presence known to all who are in pain or need, so that they too may know your love and live. And so together now we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, while the doors of the church might be closed, the ministry of the church continues on, and it continues on Here, in this place, it continues on in all of your lives as well. So we want to ask today that you continue to support the ministry of our churches through your pledges and offerings. You'll see here on the screen ways to do that, and we give thanks. We remember that all we have comes from God, and God calls us to return a portion of that to support the building of God's kingdom. Let's now join together in prayer to dedicate these offerings. Lord God, we pray that you take these offerings and that they will be used justly to continue to bring peace and well-being in our world, to build your kingdom, to bring in those who are hurt and suffering, to help those who feel excluded, to help those who are on the margins and need to hear about your good news. 
Pray, Lord, that they will be used for those ends. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. want everyone to know today that you are a child of God, loved by God, shown mercy and grace through Jesus Christ. And those are the only labels, the only categories that mean anything. All the others, cast them aside. You are a beloved child of God. So let's live that out in our world and to our hurt and broken world, let people know that they too are loved by God. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be blessed and be at peace. Amen. Amen.